Does Liz Truss have the zeal of the convert? I think she does. Everyone knows she voted Remain. But if you look at the debates that were going on in government over the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill before it was actually published, we know that she was constantly trying to toughen the bill up, ably supported, by the way, at the time by Suella Braverman, and others in government were constantly trying to water the bill down. So, if you like, she proved her bona fides over that bill. And when people said to me during the leadership, can you vote for Liz Trust? Do you trust her on Europe? My answer was, well, if she's good enough for Bill Cash and Sir John Redwood and Sir Ian Duncan Smith and Steve Baker and David Jones... The Spartans! She's good enough for me. And, and she's been very robust on this. But, you know, why must we address this? Look, mm. the late David Trimble, a widely respected man, said we had to do something about this to uphold the Good Friday Agreement, which is the absolute basis of peace in Northern Ireland. So don't take it from me, take it from a man who was a Nobel laureate, OK? Trimble argued we must do this to uphold the Good Friday Agreement. I think he's right. The Prime Minister has said we're willing to be reasonable, we prefer a negotiated solution with the EU, but if they won't do that, then the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill has already gone through the Commons, we now need to get it through the Lords. So we will, if we have to, legislate domestically in order to address this issue. Quite often with the EU, you only get a concession at the 11th hour, and it may be that we need the compression of this in order to get them to be reasonable. I hope they will, but if they won't, we should legislate to solve the problem. Our current Prime Minister played a blinder as Trade Secretary with all those trade deals. Uh, she does seem to have the zeal of the convert, and she's been very bold and very politically courageous in relation to this budget, and I believe she'll stand her ground on that one, notwithstanding the current economic headwinds. Do you think she's got the balls to see Brexit through too, including standing firm on the Northern Ireland Protocol? Uh, uh, the political will. Well, uh, does she have the cojones to do it? <laughs> I believe that she does. I think there's a very steely side to Liz Truss, mm. And I think we're going to see that come out very evidently over the next few months. Look, there is a worldwide phenomenon of, of inflation. This is not unique to the United Kingdom. Inflation has been breaking out all over the world, one, because of the economies recovering post the pandemic, and two, because of the war in Ukraine, as they, as they used to say years ago, don't they know there's a war on? Right? So central banks across the globe have been raising interest rates to combat inflation, perhaps most aggressively the Fed in the United States. So what we're doing here, and remember rate setting is for the independent Bank of England, is not incongruent with what other central banks have been doing across the world. Correct, correct, indeed so, and I think Germany have hit 10% inflation today, so, and, and uh, they face a winter energy crisis. So, you know, we've got low unemployment, I think the fundamentals of the British economy are good. However, uh, can the British economy stomach a trade war with the EU, which could be a consequence of us unilaterally scrapping the protocol? No, I don't think there's going to be a trade war, because point one... Who, who was it that triggered Article 16? Mm. It wasn't us, it was the European Commission. Now, it was a sort of overnight spasm. If you remember, the, the context of the time was over vaccines, an issue close to your heart. Yes. But, you know, in, by the, in the cold light of morning, they felt embarrassed and they withdrew it, but they did it nonetheless. But at the first opportunity, they threatened to erect a, a border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, something that they'd said was the stumbling block for Brexit for years. Well, they created, in effect, a hard border overnight and then thought better of it in the cold light of morning. In terms of the, the thing about a trade war, I think it's very unlikely because that would require unanimity. Mm. And because of the attitude of certain EU countries towards the Ukraine, I think it's very unlikely that countries in Eastern Europe would support any kind of trade war with the United Kingdom. I mean, on another occasion when we have more time, there are very interesting developments within the European Union, and many of the Eastern European countries are increasingly, in simple terms, getting more and more fed up with being told what to do. So I don't think those countries would be likely to support 
a unilateral motion for a trade war against the United Kingdom. And of so, course, so, we, so, um, we know the Italians have, have a, uh, a, a perhaps a slightly more Eurosceptic Prime Minister now, or potential Prime Minister. Well, I, I think slightly is an understatement. Mm. But you also, you know, from, from the EU establishment's point of view, they now have a difficult Prime Minister in Italy. They have a difficult Prime Minister in Hungary. They have quite a Eurosceptic Prime Minister in Poland. And that is to name but three. So the EU establishment, for want of a better phrase, is not getting it all its own way. I talk a lot about that in the book, in fact. So, so I don't think, to answer your question directly, in that context, the EU could get unanimity for a trade war with Britain. So I think it's an empty threat. Uh, this book must have been a labour of love, as, as has been supporting our departure from the EU. And it was a very lonely place to be a Brexiteer for a long time. It kind of was. The book tells the story of the 28 so-called Spartans, we were nicknamed by the media, we didn't, um, uh, who held out to the end against Theresa May's so-called withdrawal agreement, which unfortunately, had it passed, would have had precisely the opposite effect. It was very carefully drafted to lock us in forever. Yeah, no but, trade deals, customs union effectively. No, well, if you're in a customs union, and by the way, once you went in, you couldn't get out. That was one of the hearts of the argument. It was what was known in Parliament as the Hotel California dilemma. You can check out, but you can never leave. If we'd, got, if we'd signed up to that hook, line and sinker, we effectively would have been locked into the European Union forever. It was deliberately drafted that way by some very clever people. They nearly got away with it, but I would argue that 28 Tory MPs in the end stopped them in their tracks. So Brexit is still in our, in our, in our grasp, a proper Brexit. Are you optimistic about what can be achieved following our departure from the EU? Because if you speak to the likes of Ben Habib, who's been a long-term Brexit supporter, he thinks that arguably the current deal is worse than Remain. No. We left the European Union in 2020. We left under UK law, under the Withdrawal Act, and under EU law, under Article 50. We're out. We withdrew our MEPs from the European Parliament because we were no longer entitled to them. But there is still work to do. We've just discussed the protocol. We must resolve that to uphold the Good Friday Agreement and keep peace in Northern Ireland. There are also things like Ian Duncan Smith's Tigger report about deregulation. Mm. We need to use our new freedoms outside of the straitjacket of the EU to improve our competitiveness. So things like the so-called Solvency II directive, we need to address that so that our insurance companies can unlock billions of pounds of and their the, funds the, to the invest. The very bold budget has a flavour of Brexit to it, doesn't it? Don't you think? Britain aiming to become a low-tax, high-growth economy. <laughs> Well, you see, yes, and when you look at some of the criticism, let's just look at one, let's look at the 45p rate, mm. and the left have been in paroxysms over this. Look, in 1988, Nigel Lawson, in that radical budget, famously reduced the top rate of tax from 60p in the pound to 40. What happened? The tax take went up. Under Brown, it went back up to 50%. 2013, under George Osborne, we reduced it from 50 to 45 what happened? The tax take went up because people had greater incentive to work harder and to invest money and create jobs. Lower, flatter taxes tend to raise more revenue. So what this budget is designed to do is to boost growth, to get the economy firing on all cylinders so that the size of the cake becomes larger. And rather than it's constant... Not, it's not trickle-down economics, is it? No, it's, it's, no, it's trickle-up. It's, it's not trickle-anything. It's boost-up economics. Mm. It's designed to really get the economy firing on all cylinders to create more wealth so that there is a large... Not, so instead of just arguing about how you slice up the cake you just have a bigger cake to divide. At the heart of the opposition is the politics of envy, and anyone who thinks that the Labour Party has suddenly discovered the principle of fiscal rectitude has forgotten about Liam Byrne's famous note, you know, when we took over in 2010, sorry, there's no money, good luck. That's the Labour Party. Uh, a brief word about those who are, who are having a tough time in relation to Brexit. Small businesses with more paperwork, companies that don't bother to export to the EU anymore because of the cost and the bureaucracy. What would you say to them? Uh, can we just reflect on the downside of Brexit for some and can that be fixed? Well, Because we shouldn't ignore it, should we? Well, you see, part of the problem of being in the European Union mm. was that all those regulations applied in the UK, even to companies that never export a thing.
Yeah. EU law was prevalent. So now those companies are no longer subject to those laws. But because we transported them all over automatically when we left, what we need to do is now actually change some of those laws so that we can exploit to the maximum our potential competitive advantage so that in future all of those laws will not apply in the way that they do now. Brexit, it was an opportunity and not a threat. The Tory party still has a majority of about 76 in the House of Commons and we need to exploit that majority to free up our economy so that people can take full advantage, including small businesses, mm. of the fact that we now maintain and control our own destiny. Plus, uh, being out of the EU is an insurance policy against ever being in the Euro, single Europe European army, ever closer union, and the project, which is to create the United States of Europe. Well, the, the it's all the things that won't happen that I think make Brexit great. I think, I suspect, over the next 10 years, there will be a much greater move to a fully federal state in the European Union. Mm. And if that is correct, then our decision to leave will be shown to have been an even better one than we realise it is today. Who knew? Um, do enjoy conference. Thank you. Uh, including all the, uh, all the stuff that happens in the main hall and maybe some karaoke as well. Have you got a karaoke special? Um, I want to be free. Oh, that's a classic. <laughs>